that brings us to the end of the talks and into the question and answer session. Hello, everybody. Um, so in the question and answer session, I do encourage you to pose your questions in the chat uh, in, in, in the Q&A section. Um, uh, we, you know, we've got all of the presenters uh, here with us at the moment, and uh, so we'll be really keen to to um uh, to discuss any of your questions uh, that these presentations may have come up with. And we'll start off with uh, one that's come in. Uh, could you please explain the meaning of pre-competitive for a layman, non-English speaker? Uh, Andrew, uh, could you answer that one? Yes, that's a great question, and uh, perhaps one that perhaps uh, people not from um, Australia would, wouldn't be familiar with. So, thank you for the question. Essentially, what pre-competitive means in, in Australia, there is a framework for companies wishing to do exploration for resources to compete for um, tenements. Um, it's a competitive process, whether it be first past the post or whether it be a bidding process. It actually goes into a, uh, a system whereby each of the regulators allow uh, companies to bid for an area. Um, so what we do is we provide the geological information that precedes that process, which is what you've heard all about today. So we go, we, and, the, and the whole point of the process of pre-competitive information is to de-risk, technically de-risk an area based on the geology to reduce those barriers of entry for um, for companies going in and maybe bidding on an area that they wish to then uh, develop. Um, the pre-competitive model is a very successful one. It's used by a number of countries around the world, inclu including Australia, of course. Um, and what we see is that uh, where you have a, a pre-competitive uh, system of uh, data availability, you get uh, very good exploration results as a country, particularly in areas that are greenfield areas where you want to open up new resource event, uh, areas or new provinces, uh, because of course private companies are very keen to um, look at their around their, their areas, but perhaps they're not so keen to move into those uh, uh, more greenfield areas. And what we find in Australia, in terms of the minerals sector at least, uh, many of those greenfield areas are picked up by small, uh, are basically investigated by small companies companies and therefore they don't necessarily have the deep pockets to be able to um, purchase or, or do those data uh, collect those data sets themselves so that's where the government steps in and fills that gap and provides that pre-competitive or non rivalrous as economists would call it uh, data i hope that answers the question great thanks andrew heat um i was wondering on that on that view in terms of like how did uh, how do we decide what, what it is that we, you know, that we should focus on? Uh, how do we go about that? Thanks, Carol, uh, for your question. Uh, yeah, that, that was a, a very diff, uh, a very extended process in the beginning of the program, because as you've probably heard, well, as you've heard today, um, in all the talks, there's lots of potential in Australia. So one of the questions was, well, where do we start and how do we move forward with the program? Um, you've heard in a couple of the talks, um, a series of overarching frameworks that have been put forward. And so I guess we're really standing on the shoulders of giants in some respects, because there's a lot of information that's already been collected, but uh, pulling it all together and doing that data analysis is something where the Exploring for the Future program is really, is really moving forward. So we heard that um, for the mineral sector, for instance, uh, the Uncover Amira Roadmap was something that brought academia, government and um, industry together to agree on a, uh, the priorities that required across the country to really make that biggest material difference in understanding of the prospectivity. So that really provided a list of the high and highest priorities for the pre-competitive geoscience to, to work on. And, most of what the Exploring for the Future program is doing in the mineral, for the mineral sector is aligned with those priorities. Um, for energy um, work that we've done at uh, Geoscience Australia over the last sort of 15 or so years, has really built up a nice uh, understanding of what the major data gaps are for the various basins, both off and onshore. This program we're in at the moment, focusing on the onshore, um, but uh, that information that we've gathered together to, to really understand what the current state of knowledge is for each of the basins is, is a series of sort of onshore basin inventories uh, where we've identified the gaps that we need to fill and what key data sets are required to fill those knowledge gaps. 
Um, for groundwater, um, we're working very closely with our colleagues at the Bureau of Meteorology who uh, have the legislative responsibility for water in Australia, as well as the state and territory uh, governments on really understanding what it is we can do in a national sense for groundwater to better understand the resource potential and uh, its potential allocation and use. One of the key things for groundwater, I think, is looking at the unallocated groundwater. Uh, and so that's likely to be at deeper depths in the aquifers. And so our geological understanding and the, and the techniques and, and tools that we use to understand the deep geology is really coming to the fore here and, and getting a sense of how we can perhaps make more use of that unallocated, unallocated groundwater. So again, it's, it was, a, it was a, again, understanding what was already known and using that as a, as a basis for making those decisions about where we prioritise our work. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. That, uh, that provides, a, a, I think, a nice context in terms of, um, you know, how we got to um, uh, design the program that we do have. Uh, Jeff, uh, in your talk, you showed some excellent examples of the impact of this work to uncover, a, you know, a frontier uh, uh, province or provinces uh, in this particular case. I was wondering whether you could comment. Uh, do, do you have any particular data sets that, uh, that are your particular favourites uh, that, that you think are, are most impactful in achieving that type of goal? Yeah, thanks, Carol. Um, well, Probably the short answer is actually is no, it, not to, to say that there's no particular favourite. And I think uh, one of the things uh, I hope I showed in the talk was that our initial approach in that uh, covered region between Tennant and, and Man Isa was to collect quite a quite a wide diversity of, of data sets across that region, um, which were measuring different physical properties of the rocks. So that included, as we saw, reflection seismic, passive seismic, um, magnetotellurics, um, as well as our gravity and magnetic coverages, um, and as well as the AEM. So we collected all of those things in the same area so that we could get a more comprehensive picture of the geology because any one of those data sets is typically only measuring one of the properties, the rocks, rather than giving us the full picture. So um, I think it was the power of collecting multiple data sets in one area that, that um, particularly with the East Tenant story for the mineral systems work, that um, uh, allowed us to define a corridor of interest, I guess, which then uh, prompted further follow-up. Um, in the in the uh, Carrara Subbasin example, I guess the initial property of interest was the, the uh, gravity low that was, was seen in the gravity data, but that was then tested with seismic. Um, and then in both cases, I think the stratigraphic drilling was a really, a really important test um, I think if we had stopped at collecting geophysical data, uh, we would have had some nice indications or hints of, of what's going on there. But I think it's the testing those things with physical rock samples that gives people the confidence uh, that the interpretation of the geophysics is um, is is uh, appropriate, or or you know you get the, the the truth, I guess, once you get your rocks and you can do a whole bunch of analyses on actual rock samples. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's a long winded way of saying I think you need to do quite a diverse range of things in these covered regions to give people enough confidence that um, the geology is well enough, well enough understood that um, people can make decisions to come in and, and explore in the right places. Thanks for the considered answer, Jeff, uh, highlighting that it's actually the integration that's important across these different things as opposed to a silver bullet of a particular data set. Uh, we've got a question uh, here uh, around uh, hydrogen. So this is for, for Andrew. Um, so how much, uh, what percentage of total energy of Australia can be replaced by hydrogen and how long uh, would that take? Yeah, thanks very much for the question uh, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, look, um, I, it, it's not just, I guess, a hydrogen story in Australia. There's a very large um, uh, conversion of our energy system towards electrification. So that's the primary way uh, we're looking at um, decarbonizing uh, Australian energy. However, hydrogen can, can make a significant component and um, it's envisaged that, you know, certainly a large problem, well, the, the gap can be filled by hydrogen in Australia, and we're looking at exporting um, hydrogen on top of that as well. So yeah, I think hydrogen can really play a significant role. 
Thanks, Andrew. Um, maybe I'll uh, uh, I'll kind of z zoom out a, a little bit more on the on the kind of theme of collecting a really large amount of data. Uh, Laura, one for you is it, you gave a long list of various things that we're doing uh, covering a huge amount of Australia. Uh, logistically, like how, how does that happen? How, how do we contact all the people that uh, the, that all this work have, you know, uh, uh, where all this work is happening? Yeah, thanks, Carol. Uh, it is a large task. Um, one of the key things we're trying to do is um, contact stakeholders, landholders early. So this process is is not quick. Um, it's important that we have these conversations um, over a, 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 a measured period of time. Uh, we at Geoscience Australia follow the principles of uh, free, prior and informed consent in all of our engagements and we don't undertake any field work uh, without first obtaining that land access from, from the landholders. We work with the local jurisdictions uh, and as I said, seek to engage early with, with stakeholders to ensure that um, we're, we're having those conversations and they have the information in an accessible way that enables them to make informed decisions. Uh, and part of that accessibility is, is translating the technical science into um, information that for non-technical audiences. So we've got a, a series of um, animations that we've developed that help to explain some of those cons complex um, techni techniques that we use, like airborne electromagnetics, we've talked about a bit, um, magnetotelluric, seismic, even drilling, uh, in ways that um, the, the general public can understand. And we're actually translating those into um, common languages around uh, across our various um, project areas, including some um, First Nations languages. Uh, and we have dedicated resources focused on this. As I said, it is a large task. Um, and, uh, and certainly uh, the first phase of the program was in across Northern Australia, where we didn't um, perhaps have as many stakeholders to engage with. Uh, there were large um, areas of land uh, held by a single um, landholder, for example, whereas moving into the South, we've got much uh, greater diversity, larger population density. So there's a, a larger number of stakeholders, greater diversity, um, in their backgrounds and, and interest and understanding of the program that we need to engage with. Um, we do our best to uh, coordinate our engagement activities so that um, we're not, not bothering people uh, with too many uh, approaches. So we try and coordinate not only across the program, but also across the organisation. Uh, and we do our best to mitigate and um, minimise any harm to the environment um, livelihoods of landholders, native title um, and cultural heritage, and as well as uh, applying um, complying with biosecurity requirements. So it's a complex space to work in. Uh, we're on a, um, uh, I guess, a improvement curve in how we do this. Um, we don't profess to be the experts, but um, we work closely with people who have done a lot of this themselves. Uh, and the, I guess the final other point I'd, I'd raise, Carol, is that uh, we, we go about engaging uh, traditional custodians to also monitor and provide cultural heritage uh, clearances when we're deploying equipment on the ground to make sure that we're um, doing due diligence around ensuring the protection of these valuable assets. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think there's a there, there's a question here in the chat also uh, for you. Uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, is are there any plans to, to uh, collect further controlled source seismic data, so reflection seismic, for example, uh, to accompany the Osiray deployment? Uh... So reflection seismic, yes. So uh, I talked about the um, darling Kernamona Delamarian reflection seismic, uh, which is co it will be co coincident with um, some of the Osiray deployments. Uh, is that sort of what you were getting at, Carol? Sorry, I'm just trying to read the question at the same time. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's the question. Uh, it's uh, it's where, whether there's reflection seismic um, uh, being uh, being acquired to accompany Osiray, or possibly even wide angle um, refraction, you know, controlled source. And I think you, you've answered that question. Uh, so thank you very much, Laura. Um, um, let me just. Uh, 
while, while I'm looking at uh, uh, at, uh, at the other questions that are that are coming in, I've got another one for Ariane. Um, so Andrew pointed out that uh, the, the incredible benefits uh, that, that are coming out of um, the mineral potential mapper work, uh, which stimulated um, uh, the Julemar discovery. And my question is: is there is is there a plan to continue that sort of work or extend it um, uh, as part of the exploring for the future program? Thanks, Carol. Uh, so at the moment, we're looking to release the results of the upcoming mineral potential mapping work as uh, web map services on the portal. And we are currently still investigating uh, the possibility of making new mineral potential mapper tools for each of the different mineral systems that we're currently working on. So it's a work in progress. Um, I don't have an answer for you right now, uh, but we will be delivering the results as web map services on the portal for sure. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Ariane. And just on that note, um, I was just wondering if you can comment on maybe the use of uh, artificial intelligence. That seems to be the the, the hot thing at the moment, uh, and the the way that mineral potential was uh, was made, kind of not using that at the moment. Uh, do you want to comment on that? So, I mean, we'll be using the similar kind of approach for the mineral potential mapping work that we're currently doing. Um, however, we are investigating the use of different machine learning techniques for some of the feature engineering to develop some of the input data sets and to assess those predictive relationships between those data sets and known mineralizations. So while we won't be using it explicitly in the mineral potential mapping itself, we might be using it to help generate some of our input data sets. Thanks, Ariane. Um, we've got another question, I think, for Andrew uh, here. So uh, thank you very much for this very interesting session about the H2 storage potential of salt. Uh, it is important to assess and map the continuous thickness of good quality halite for this seismic data and detailed well data, such as logs uh, are needed when available. Is such data available to private companies? Uh, what is the procedure to obtain them? Yes, well, virtually all that data is made freely available. Uh, for offshore environments, you can access that information from Geoscience Australia and through um, the NOPIM um, system. Uh, so get in contact with us, get in contact with us with it for, for that. Uh, for onshore, um, we have quite a collection ourselves of onshore available seismic that you can use and also uh, well information, but for really a much more comprehensive assessment, you would go to the relevant state where you're going. And the state governments all have their own data systems, which um, which they make available all the um, seismic and um, well data that's been collected. So yeah, it's a really fantastic issue and a um, uh, resource in Australia that uh, this information is made publicly available as pre-competitive information to attract in, um, further investment into the country. Thanks, Andrew. I think that uh, that, that raises, uh, I suppose, a question. You know, what, what, why doesn't Geoscience Australia and and the state surveys indeed charge for for, for this type of information? Because that happens uh, in a lot of other places around the world. Uh, Andrew Heap, do do you mind maybe commenting on that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Carol. Look, uh, that's a perennial question that we get asked. Um, I think the model for pre-competitive geoscience is very well, well established. Um, you know, Australia has been a world leader in this, but there are other countries that do it as well. Uh, and everywhere that those countries do this sort of work, you see um, unprecedented rates of exploration, particularly into greenfield areas. Um, I think that uh, if you, we have doubt been down the path of cost recovery in the in the past, and what we've seen is it very much limits the number of companies and the opportunities that those companies may wish to explore, and therefore it's relatively uh, the success of the discoveries are, are fewer. Uh, and the, uh, in terms of the government's point of view, well, that's not ideal, right? We want to we want to get the resources uh, developed, uh, obviously ethically and sustainably. Um, but the but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if you don't if you go down the path of cost recovery and really limit the number of uh, well the geographical area sometimes where people will pick up data uh, and also the types of companies that may be uh, avail themselves of that data because you know particularly you know seismic data and um, 
um, some of those um, other major large data sets that they're quite expensive. And if you don't have deep pockets, you may not get access to them. So it, it actually curtails um, um, uh, activity, industry activity. And it also uh, is not necessarily a level playing field when it comes to uh, opening up exploration areas. Thanks, Andrew, um, for that answer. And uh, I suppose it raises a, a question in my mind in terms of, uh, Jeff, you showed a, a really nice example of, of zooming across scales, uh, going right down to the to, to the drill hole. Uh, so at what point does, uh, does pre-competitive stop um, uh, to, to stimulate industry and uh, an exploration begin? Do you, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, um... I guess again, it's probably not a, a very clear cut answer because I think there's a there is a bit of a blurry line to some extent there. But um, overall, um, I guess it comes back to to some extent it comes back to scale and and comes back to the intent of the data collection um, that we're involved in. And so you would see you would have seen in some of the in many of the talks, um, you know, regional to even continental scale with our, with our big data collections to get the overall geological architecture or framework story. But even when we do zoom down to more local scales, including down to the scale of a drill hole with our stratigraphic drilling, the, the design of those drill holes and the intent behind them is not to discover a deposit, for example. It's to understand the geology in an area where we think there are interesting features. Uh, and that's so that the, the, the positioning of those holes um, is designed to test some geological architecture features or, or lithology or stratigraphy or something of that nature rather than uh, as a, an ex a true exploration company would, would be perhaps interested in that, but the, what their real target is is actually the, the, the gold at the end or you know, the deposit at the end of that. So um, yeah, I, I think it's a question of scale and also the, d the design uh, with the, the sort of underlying intent behind it, where for us the intent is what are what are the barriers for companies coming into an e a region and what can we do to help lower those barriers uh, rather than um, actually finding the um, the prize, I suppose. Thank you for the for again a very considered answer, uh, Jeff. And uh, uh, I might turn now to um, to Andrew Fights. Um, Andrew, that was a great, great overview of the uh, of the hydrogen, I suppose, industry that's that's uh, that's starting to form in Australia. And I was wondering whether you can comment on um, how does Australia's hydrogen potential, uh, I suppose, compare with other parts of the world. Thanks, Carol. Uh, yeah, no, Australia has very good hydrogen potential that's been assessed by us and by others. I guess we have um, very good. Uh, renewable energy resources, good wind resources and good solar resources and lots of land, but also a very large coastline. So for export type hydrogen, we can tap into desalination as a water source and that studies have shown actually contributes only a very small cost to the overall cost of hydrogen. But we also have, you know, lots of natural gas um, and there are a couple of uh, uh, blue, I guess what you would call blue hydrogen projects under development around Australia. Uh, well, not under development, under con, um, um, under consideration. And uh, these would take advantage of Australia's uh, geological storage resources. So we have some really nice basins that could be suitable for geological storage. Great, thanks Andrew Fights. Uh, and I think that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, today, for, for letting us share with you what we're doing uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and hopefully providing you a, a, a broader picture in terms of what, uh, what's happening in the geosciences in Australia. So thank you very much for joining. Um, uh, I hope you can tune in next time. Bye-bye.